Welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. The U.S. government has a bad track record of trampling rights after natural and man-made disasters. We had warrantless house-to-house searches after the Boston Marathon, gun confiscation after Katrina, and the police state has continued to grow under the Patriot Act since 9-11. How will the U.S. government treat us after the coming economic collapse? Finca Bayano is now offering sustainable farmlands in Panama. If you decide to bug out, do it in a community with like-minded preppers in Finca Bayano, Panama. Check them out online today at fincabayano.com. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, water filters, bug out bags, and first aid kits. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON for 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. Today's guest is Fabian Calvo of FabianForLiberty.com. Fabian, welcome back to the show. Hey Mark, always a pleasure to be on. Oh, absolutely. Now, you just finished a new book, The Global Economic Reset. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I about a few years back, I, I started to really hear um, a lot of different economic theories from contacts I have on Wall Street and, and hedge funds and, and what have you. And, and I started to do my own research. I mean, basically, based on first just the collapsing U.S. dollar and, and the the money printing that's going on. And um, just being a student of history, I started to realize that, you know, in, in modern history, and I say modern history, let's say the last 600 years, um, there's been six economic resets. And by economic resets, I mean uh, the world reserve currency status being lost by one nation and transferred over to another. When that takes place, there's typically wars. Uh, there's a lot of bad things that typically happen, um, whether it's depressions, economic collapses, uh, hyperinflation. And then I realized, you know what? It's really nothing new because we look back in ancient history. It happened with the Romans. It happened with the Byzantine Empire. And so it's always centered around four characteristics that I lay out in the book and that I go through these different examples, um, which are too much war, too much debt, too much political corruption, and too much elite decadence. And we look at America today, Mark, and I think your audience would would, would agree that we that, that America has all of those hallmarks today, and it's dangerously close, I believe, to um, experiencing a loss of economic sovereignty. Uh, you know, it, many times people will, will, will hear this, and you get certain people say, well, this is fear porn, or it's just, and I often tell them, look, this isn't even my theory per se. It's more just historical fact that we could look back at other societies, other civilizations have the same experiences, and they all had the same characteristics that America has today. So um, I, I, I think it's something that people really need to wake up to and 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 understand, so they know here what what they you know what to look out for. And that's what the book talks about. It also gives uh, a lot of different steps that I know high net worths on Wall Street are taking to prepare themselves and insulate themselves from this chaos that will eventually come. And a lot of those steps, Mark, are things that the average person can do. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, I often say, look, it's, it's better to be prepared several years before um, versus a few days too late. And I, I don't know when the time will happen. But again, I know that looking at history, looking at America today, I'm convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that we're on the precipice of, uh, of the next global economic reset. So it's something that always happens. It's not something that might happen or could happen. It's something that has always happened. And I think that the only reason people think that it's not going to happen is it's just that normous, normalcy bias syndrome that because it's never happened to them and it hasn't happened to their country in their lifetime, that in, in their mind, it's just not something they ever want to think could ever possibly happen. There's no doubt. You hit the nail right on the head. The normalcy bias, I mean, look, the average American – has grown up thinking the United States is this incredible bastion of liberty and freedom, that we're the strongest military in the world. And certainly that was the case perhaps prior to World War II, after World War II. But we can clearly see now that the pillars of that economic freedom, of that, you know, just personal liberty 
are being eroded in the last 10 years from the NSA to Homeland Security to the TSA to the bail-ins, the bailouts, the devaluation of the dollar. I mean, really, the list goes on and on. But I think one of the interesting points is, which is I think where most people uh, recognize, look, there's big economic problems in America, but we still have the largest military in the world, so no one's going to fool with us. Well, you look at the headlines over the last six months. I mean, this so-called Obama pivot to Asia the Pentagon's on record saying, look, we don't have the, we don't have the manpower. We don't have the tech, the, 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 the weapons to, to be able to send over, um, more military aid and more military equipment to that region as we could have maybe just 20 years ago. Or look at the returning veterans. I mean, you know, they've been deployed, many of them, four and five times. Uh, the military stretched too thin. They're worn out. And as I heard it put, I forgot by who, just, uh, a couple of weeks back, it were literally England in 1939, which was in massive debt, had fought way too many wars going back to the Boer War, World War I. And by the time World War II rolled around, they would have been crushed if it wasn't for America stepping in and helping them uh, and, and helping them out. And then speaking of veterans uh, in my space, which is, you know, the, the prepper space, um, there's a lot of prep. There's a lot of preppers that have been in military service because a lot of them have been in other places of the world and they've seen how bad it gets when when uh when you have uh, economic st- instability or wars or anything else and, and my grandmother she just turned 100 last year so she's actually <laughs> older than the fed <laughs> so she's been around since we had you know since back when we, we had real money and uh uh you know of course when she was a teenager she had to go through the the depression and and the few people that are still left from that generation they don't have that normalcy bias and they they understand how th- bad things can get now i guess my question to you would be do you expect this reset to be similar to what we had in the great Dis- depression or do you think there's a lot more energy built up in this system do you think that this could be something that could be uh orders of magnitude worse than what we went through in the great depression yeah i think that i mean you know and this has been talked about a lot if we factor real unemployment uh what it is a real unemployment mark we're we're, we're looking at well over 20 percent real unemployment i mean the 6.3 percent is a complete fictitious number based on the, an incredibly shrinking labor pool. So Great Depression had 20% plus employment. We have that now. By all accounts, in my opinion, we're in a depression. The only thing that makes it maybe even look like we're not is the incredible amount of phony monopoly money that the Federal Reserve is creating. Now, you know, just today, Yellen came out and said, look, we're going to need more stimulus. Uh, and because the 2% inflation targets fallen uh, b- below 2%, they, they're targeting 2% inflation. Let's just look at their target of inflation for 2%, and let's say that's what it is. I think everybody that's gone to a grocery store in the last couple days and has been going grocery shopping for, let's say, the last couple of years knows real prices of commodities have surged 20% plus, depending on what commodity you're talking about. And there, but, but again, let's keep with that fictitious 2%. Factor that out over the next 20, 30 years. You're talking about a third devaluation in the U.S. dollar. I think that with the global economic reset, and, and again, this is, you know, uh, when, when I hear the IMF, when I hear the Chinese, when I hear countries around the world saying we need either a new super global currency or we need a new world reserve currency, I believe those countries are working on doing that. They're not just saying that. It's not just rhetoric. And so I think that when the dollar loses its world reserve currency status, you're going to see the trillions of dollars that are offshore are going to come flooding back to the country. Like it happened in the French hyperinflation before the, before the French Revolution and and like it happened in England as well. And and I think that's going to create massive inflation in the country. And you're going to see the purchasing power of the average American go down by probably half. And by that in and of itself, we'll have major depression, starvation in this country. And, 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 you know, this may sound sinister, Mark, but I, I believe that the powers that be, this is what they want. They know this is coming. They want destabilization because this is how they can seize more and more control, and I think that's exactly what they want. So you hit on a lot of really, really important topics there. Let's go back in and, and dissect that and uh, 
and get into some of the details of some of that. You, you, you mentioned that unemployment, while the government's telling us that it's 6.3%, you said that uh, the actual number is closer to 20? I, I mean, this is, you know, you look at people like John Williams from Shadow Stats and several other uh, economists that look at real data prior to the phony gimmicks that were changed uh, in the early 1980s. If you account for unemployment the way they did back during the Depression, we would be at way over 20 percent unemployment. We have close to 100 million Americans out of the labor force. In addition, the unemployment, the, the, the male participation rate in the labor market is at the lowest level ever recorded since they started recording it. So, you know, behind the, the, the veil of the mainstream media, corporate run media that's promoting this fictitious recovery, uh, the real numbers and the real evidence, I think, speak pretty clearly. And uh, you mentioned the amount of people that are outside of the, the labor force now. I think the labor participation rate has dropped to 62, uh, 62.8, which is a level we haven't seen since the 70s. Now, in the 70s, most households had only one person working. Basically, you had Ward Cleaver working all day. June took care of Wally and the Beaver and uh, and took care of the home. Have we achieved that level of prosperity where we can once again get by with only one person working in the home? Yeah, I mean, you, that, that's it's a perfect point, Mark. I mean, inflation has forced – and again, this is in my opinion by design – inflation has ha, has forced – now, both husband and wife to go out into the labor force. And, and, and you know, not only has it done that, but the, but the current uh, society and, and this just this insanity that we hear, this constantly pushing race and division. I mean, if you even talk about what you just said, you're a racist because you want to see women raising kids and at home. And look, you know, the, the bottom line is that women are the nurturers. They're the ones that you know, are the gatherers. They're the ones that do that. The men are the hunters. That is that is going back to primal, just the primal instinct of the human species. And and I think that society has purposely uh, created an environment where both the man and wife are out of the household. The kids are turned over to these re-education camps known as public schools. And we see the decline, not only in morality, but in just our civilization because of the conditions that always stem, Mark, I think it's important to note, most of these cultural uh, changes, they pretty much always stem from economics. And and we've seen what the Federal Reserve has singly, single-handedly done with the U.S. dollar, and I think it's pretty clear their intentions go beyond just creating inflation. I think their intentions go to redesigning the world as they know it um, and, and creating this new dystopia that I think are, 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 are that a lot of Americans are clearly not prepared for. And you mentioned racism. If we think that uh, June should be at home taking care of Wally and the beef. Now, what do you think about all the media controversy over Jay-Z's 5% nation medallion? The 5%ers, uh, which are an offshoot of Islam in, in Harlem, think that the black man is God and claim that white men are devils. Does that sound racist? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, the double standard is just so incredible. You know, where are the calls – for people to have him forced to sell his production studio? Where are the calls for him to be banned from life from hip hop? Well, there's nowhere because no one's making those calls. It's clearly a double standard. I mean, look, uh, you know, we, we were talking before in the pre-interview about Donald Sterling. Is Donald Sterling a, a, a jerk? Is he, you know, I, I, is he a dirtbag? Well, probably so. I mean, it, that's been known for decades. I mean, from him, you know, basically having problems with discrimination uh, in, in renting out his apartments, to uh, him supposedly paying uh, Elgin Baylor, not paying him his wages, whatever it may be. I mean, look, the guy has a reputation from not being the nicest guy. The bottom line is, is that since when has being perceived a racist become the biggest crime in America? As long as we're talking about Sterling, Mark, we're not talking about Obama shipping arms to Al-Qaeda. We're not talking about the criminal banking cartels that never went to jail, that continue to run wild, that have created a speculative casino culture on Wall Street that is one of the leading indicators or one of the leading factors why the rest of the world is getting away from the dollar because they recognize it's a giant Ponzi scheme. Where is, you know, the, the outrage for Eric Holder shipping guns into Mexico and Fast and Furious to blame the Second Amendment? It is literally crickets. No one's talking about those real issues, and that's why you see the media 
pushing division, and it's the classic divide and conquer. But uh, with all that said, it, it's not illegal for Jay Z to to believe that uh, the black man is God and uh, white men are devils, is it? No, of course not. And it's not illegal for Sterling to, you know, if he wants to say whatever he has to say. Although I didn't, you know, necessarily interpret those comments as racist. If you really look at what he was what he was talking about, um, uh, or you know, these comments with Clive and Bundy. You know, here we go again. They they try to set him up. Uh, would I have said what Clive and Bundy said and the way he said it? No, I would have obviously articulated it better. But it's but where is the outrage, Mark, for what the welfare system has done to the black community? The new plantation is the welfare state. And let me tell you, it's not just with blacks. It's with all cultures where we have the government perpetuating the cycle of dependence and telling them, look, you can't do it because you're white, you're Hispanic, you're black, whatever it may be. And instead, it's it's you need government. You need us to help you. And that runs counter to the very principles of the foundation of this republic. Yeah, it very much seems like they're, they try to uh, maintain that system of dependency. We just saw uh, in, uh, in Washington, I believe it was Seattle, just raised their minimum wage to $15 an hour. Yeah, I mean, you know, if that's such a great idea, why don't we do $50 an hour? You know, Hawaii just wants a raise on employment to $15 an hour as well. Why stop there, Mark? If, if raising, I mean, there, there, there is this phony report that cited, I believe it was done in New Jersey. They say, well, they raised the minimum wage. It actually created more, you know, it, it, the unemployment rate went down. Well, if that works, why not have $100 an hour? Because the, the truth is, is that we know that just like, you know, pr- just like price controls end up with shortages, When you have the government dictating to employers what to pay instead of the market, uh, you create major distortions in the labor pool. It leads to higher unemployment, and it also leads to higher unemployment within within low-skilled workers, whether it's Hispanics, blacks, what have you. You're never going to hear that from the so-called minority leaders, and you're certainly not going to hear that from any Republican either who who wants to, in essence, control, uh, wants more control. That's why they haven't gone after the IRS or they haven't. And because they want those reins of control, both sides do. It's just there's just a different in, difference in rhetoric. And uh, you mentioned some of John Williams' stats now, and you also mentioned all of the money that's outside of the United States, the dollars that are outside of the United States. I think John Williams estimates that number to be close to 15 trillion dollars, which is uh, almost 50% higher than our M2 money supply. Now, what happens if all those dollars start coming back to American shores? What's that going to do to asset prices in America? I mean, I mean, you know, if you have – anytime you have a limited supply of goods and way too much money chasing it, you have prices skyrocket. And, and that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, you're going to have – Prices skyrocket, not necessarily like its wealth, although in, in the Weimar Republic for a period of time, and also we saw this in the Roman times as well, when inflation was kicking up, people thought, wow, this is real wealth. It's kind of like you, you go back to the 2008 crash. In 2006, 2007, I saw this in real estate. All these millionaires that were real estate investors on paper. The truth is, is that they were just benefiting from the cheap money that was boosting asset prices. Uh, when that Ponzi scheme crashed, they were left holding the bag, and many of them had to go bankrupt. That's exactly what will happen when the trillions of dollars come back flooding into America. And, you know, Mark, it's, it, it's very interesting because they think that this isn't just a problem for America. This is a problem for the entire West. The Western banks hold 60% of their reserves, their U.S. dollars. They recognize the trouble they're in. That's why you're seeing – uh, London, Switzerland, yesterday we heard Frankfurt, Germany, beginning to accept and beginning to roll out Chinese bonds uh, of the Chinese currency for two years. They want to do it a little bit longer. They're calling them dim sum. And, and that's a growing factor. I mean, you look at, for example, the Chinese currency 10 years ago. It, it, it was very little used on the world stage. Today, it's now surpassed the Swiss franc as the most used currency. Year after year, it's growing by double digits in use internationally. What's important to note is that America surpassed England as the largest economy in 1870. It took another 75 years for America to become the world reserve currency. 
Well, the World Bank is now saying by the end of this year, China will surpass the U.S. economy as the world's largest economy. We live in the world today where things move much faster. It's interconnected. And I think the ball is in motion for the eventual demise of the dollar. We may very well still use the dollar 10 years out, 15 years out. The question is, what will it be actual worth? What will it actually be able to buy? Um, and, and, and what will it, what will its, what will its loss of value mean to the middle class in America that's already has been under assault for the last several decades? And have, have the Chinese already started to, Divest of the dollar? Are they are they starting to to use that to to purchase American assets? I think last year they bought Smithfield Hams, and then there's a lot of reports that they're buying up blocks of uh, residential rental property. Is that true? Well, this is that that is true. I mean, for example, in the market that my my, my private equity invested in Detroit, um, you know, we bought in the last year or two over a thousand homes bought and sold in Detroit. The Chinese investors and a lot of Europeans as well are buying blocks of homes, hundreds of homes at a time, without even looking at them. But it's even more, I think it even goes further than that. You know, I, prior to the whole blow up of the Clive and Bundy situation, I had done an interview based on one of my contacts. He was telling me he's actually a guy who puts together the financing for these mergers and acquisitions, typically involving sovereign nations buying uh, companies either in the U.S. or in other parts of the world. And And he was telling me that, look, in the West, what, what's happening right now is the BLM is basically categorizing this land, and eventually they're going to collateralize it, and they're using a lot of this land, particularly in the West, for these big solar projects. And, and, and the Chinese are getting first dibs, not only on the solar project deals, uh, but they're getting first dibs on multiple. You mentioned Smithfield. Overnight, you know, Smithfield's the number one hog producer in the country. Overnight, China became the number one employer in multiple cities where Smithfield has a huge presence. It doesn't end there. I mean, they're 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 en entering the the U.S. car market. I mean, they just bought uh, uh, the, the the electric car Fisker that had gone bankrupt. The Chinese got permission from that from the U.S. government. The U.S. government recognizes that we sold the Chinese government. I shouldn't say we. The the, the criminal bankers on Wall Street sold the Chinese government trillions in phony mortgage-backed securities that went totally bust. In order to keep the Chinese from not dumping those U.S. treasuries that they still hold over a trillion of, they need to make sweetheart deals, accommodate them as much as possible. I often tell on people on interviews and on my YouTube channel, just Google China buys American, and you'll see all of the companies that they're buying, Mark, from battery companies to car companies to hog companies, or just the sweetheart deals they get, for example, now allowing Chinese chicken imports into the U.S., the same country that gave us uh, you know, poisonous dog food and toothpaste is now sending their chickens into this country. It's absolutely crazy. And again, it's the powers that be that are setting up these sweetheart deals out of fear that, that the Chinese have us literally over a barrel with their, with, with their influence and exercise of the, uh, uh, and control over the uh, amount of debt that they hold, U.S. debt that they hold. So the Chinese takeover is going to look more like a Wall Street merger and less like Red Dawn, it sounds like, from what you're telling us. Uh, and now you, one of the things you mentioned is that they're projected to overtake uh, the U.S. in a percentage of global GDP. Are you troubled over the first quarter GDP numbers that came out for, for the U.S. economy? I think it, it came in at 0.1% for the first quarter of 2014. Yeah, and and I and I, I I bet that will probably be as usually it is. It'll be downgraded a couple months. That'll be on page twenty of the uh, of the newspaper, so nobody will hear about it. But I've been troubled about GDP now for 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 five six years, and I'll tell you why, Mark. Because I would make the argument that we've had negative. Again, here it goes. We've been in the depression. We've had negative interest. We've had negative uh, GDP at least since two thousand and eight. It could be much longer than that. What's, what's the only reason we have a, on the surface, have a positive GDP number is because of inflation. So we have, for example, you mentioned Detroit. In Detroit, we have 50% of the manufacturing base has been completely wiped out in the last 10 years. So they're creating less, but things cost more. So if I have a widget that I used to sell, you know, 10 of, well, today I might only produce three of them. But they cost more money. So the only thing that's that's keeping a positive GDP number is inflation. 
because we can look at manufacturing and we could see in the last decade the 60,000 plus manufacturing facilities that have been shipped overseas, the, you know, the, the, the 50% plus drop in manufacturing jobs in America. How could we possibly have a GDP increasing when we have manufacturing uh, completely dwindling and being wiped out because of these uh, so-called free trade agreements? And then another factor I think that we've had to, to prop up GDP has been uh, the quantitative easing. Uh, it's scaled back now from $85 billion a month, which uh, tallied to over $1.1 trillion annually, to it's been cut almost in half to $45 billion per month. So if if they're really on track to completely eliminate it, uh, let's say 1.1 trillion dollars, that would enter, that would be about 6.5 percent of our 16.8 trillion in GDP for for 2013. If you subtracted 6.5 percent from the 2013 uh, growth rate of 1.9 percent, we'd we'd have an official number of negative 4.6 percent. Can we keep cutting QE and expect the economy not to tank? No, I mean, listen, listen like I mentioned earlier today, first off, I don't believe there's really been any taper. Uh, the $85 billion, uh, based on what I've, what I've heard from pretty good sources, was well over $125 billion because here again, we've been bailing out banks in Europe so that they basically don't get pushed into, hey, maybe we should get out of the dollar because this is not working out. So we've been able to bail them out. Banks in Europe still haven't been recapitalized. U.S. banks in America have been recapitalized because of the cheap money that they've been able to access, many of them uh, owners of the Federal Reserve. It is completely unsustainable. I mean, when we look at literally years and years of quantitative easing, Mark, and yes, today, like I mentioned earlier, the Fed uh, Chairman Yellen comes out and says, well, look, it's very probable we're going to need more stimulus. It's not working. And at any time in any economy, when currency debasement is your last tool to basically stimulate the economy, you know you're in real, real trouble. And again, this isn't Fabian Calvo saying this. This is hundreds of years of history looking at multiple different nations that have gone through the same experiment and have failed miserably. And uh, we, we talked about China's GDP, and it's and even though they've slowed and it, uh, it's still outstripping uh, America's do you think part of that has to do with regulatory costs? We see satellite photos from China of rivers that are blue with dye from denim factories uh, because they're very, very underregulated. But here in America, we see a lot of small businesses that, that close their doors because they can't keep up with all the fees, the licenses, the regulations, and all the different things that they have to comply with different health codes and, and – uh, uh, building codes and everything else. Is there a common sense solution between those two extremes? Yeah, I mean, well, look, you know, the the, the people like George Soros, a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of these liberal elites, a lot of these banking cartel members and families, all of them push for the regulation. We see this now with these big Internet companies, whether it's Google, Apple, all of them want now Internet regulation because they don't want another company to come. Uh, they don't want a new Google, for example, right? They made it, and that's what... That's what regulations are always stemming from. The big mega corporations, the big multinational corporations, they've made it. Now they want to put barriers on others to try to do the same exact thing. The, the bottom line is that our regulatory, our regulations in this country, believe it or not, are costing this country the equivalent of the top nine countries, the, the top nine countries GDP. That's how much the regulatory system in America and it's not just under Obama. Bush passed thousands of regulations. And, and, and it's literally what it's done is it's taken the greatest free market economy and it's shackled it. And it's allowed people like Soros, like I've said, who, 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 who on record are saying, look, China's the new engine of growth. And we've seen this and throughout history where uh, you can call them the New World Order. You can call them the banking oligarchs, whatever you want to call them. They build countries up. Then they tear them down. They move on to another country, build it up, tear it down. It's been going on for hundreds of years. That's exactly what America is going through right now. And then we, we touched on real estate prices a little bit. Now, what do you think about the, the rest of the real estate market here in America? We've seen a little bit of a pullback recently. Is that going to continue? Or you've said before that you expect uh, after the, the midterm elections, you expect the, the ninja loans and liar loans to start coming back? 
you know, I actually, I was a little bit early. I mean, you know, Ninja Loans and, and, and subprime loans are already back. Colony Capital, which is one of the biggest landlords uh, in America, uh, has bought tens of thousands of, of rental properties. They also have a giant mortgage division. They're entering subprime. Wells Fargo is entering subprime. And it's the same thing with the car industry. I mean, 90 percent, uh, I believe it's 85 to 90 percent of every car loan made by GM is a subprime loan. It's the only reason GM has been making any money is that they're giving out loans to anybody who could who could basically fog up a mirror. Well, you're starting to see that already happen in the real estate market. I think that we're at this end of the road cycle where we're going to continue to see real estate prices go crazy. There has been some pullback, but as soon as they start to unleash the no money down loans and all of these Wall Street hedge funds that have bought millions of homes combined can cash out to the unsuspecting no man, no money down you know, loan buyer, uh, that's gonna, that's gonna really send prices surging until we see another large collapse, I think, in asset values, not only in real estate, but we'll see the same thing in stocks, bonds. Cause I think when, when one of these bubbles begin to burst, we're gonna see a simultaneous, simultaneously a bursting of the multi-bubble economy. And we look at today, Mark, we have the student debt bubble, the unfunded liability bubble, the derivative bubble, the dollar bubble, the bond bubble, the real estate bubble, the stock. There's, it's all bubbles created by the Fed, completely unsustainable. I think when one goes down, all of them will go down. And what are your thoughts on gold and silver? They've been pummeled lately. Uh, where do you think they're headed from here? I think silver is now below $20. I think most people put the production costs for the all-in costs for an ounce of silver uh, on, of course, you know you have some mines that are that are doing it much cheaper, and some other other mines that are doing it uh, uh, not quite effic- as efficiently, and have to pay much more. But I think the average is somewhere around twenty five dollars an ounce. So, uh, where do you expect silver and gold to go from here? Well, you know, again, I, I make it really clear that I I buy gold and silver every month. I don't look at gold and silver. I, I don't even care what the prices are, Mark. I just know historically I'm going to win with gold and silver because in fiat currencies always fail. So I think people need to understand that if you buy monthly, if you average out the cost, what, I mean, I don't buy, you know, silver and gold to me is not an investment. It's like an insurance policy against failing fiat currencies. It's like I have car insurance or I used to have good health insurance until Obama screwed that up as well. Point is, is that it's an insurance policy. I think that's how people need to look at it. And um, look, you know, you have the world's elite basically buying gold and silver hand over fist while telling people it's a barbaric relic. Uh, you have central banks around the world still buying gold like crazy. China's gold purchases by 2017 will be up 25 percent. Um, and, and you know, here at home, again, we're told that you're a conspiracy theorist if you want to buy gold and silver. So, again, I don't really look at the prices. I know historically what it means to be someone who owns gold and silver. And, and I think that uh, I'm also someone who believes in real estate as well, because I think that's just a hard asset as well uh, if you could own it for cash. And, um, and, and I'm a big believer in all three. I buy all three every month, and, and I think it's one of the best hedges against the failing fiat currency of the U.S. dollar. And uh, conspiracy theorists, there's two billion of those in uh, in China and India that seem to <laughs> like buying gold and silver. That's uh, has is Alex Jones been syndicated over there? Yeah, could, it could be right. I mean, you know, the truth is, is that Chinese you know, have several business partners in China. And the Indians as well, they've always looked at gold and silver as a historic uh, store of value. You know, in America, when we started the cheap credit, the historic sense of value was the new car in your driveway, the McMansion that you could buy. That's not real wealth. That is, that, that's just debt that people are accumulating to accumulate more stuff. It's nothing real. And again, I go back to my example, Mark, about the global economic reset in, in, in the U.S. economy, you know, not surpassing the English economy until 1870. Well, in the 1800s, America was mining gold at an unprecedented rate, accumulating a ton of gold. Eventually, they had the gold, they had the gold backed dollar. Um, well, that, you know, that's very probable what China is doing. They're buying gold hand over fist with the number one buyer and miner. And um, I believe their intentions are, are pretty clear that they want to have a currency that they want to internationalize. And I think the fastest way for them to do it is down the road for them to begin to back their gold, back their currency by gold. And the way that I see that scenario breaking down is that the Chinese can make an announcement and say, look, 
the dollar is unsustainable. It's too risky. We're going to now back our currency by gold. And you could likely see a country like Russia come out and say, look, we're only going to take uh, payment for our oil and gas in the new Chinese currency. I have absolutely zero doubt that this new Eastern Bloc alliance, which has been going on for 100 years, but I think more so we've seen the Chinese and Russians of late more strategically partnering on a variety of things from military to economic treaties to what have you. I think I have no doubt in my mind they want to directly challenge the U.S. dollar supremacy. They're beginning to lay the groundwork for that right now. And with the sanctions and the threats that we've made against Russia, are we uh, hastening the the death of the dollar by by that? I think that those those sanctions have a real big boomerang effect. Uh, you know, maybe not this time. I mean, there's some in fact I'm going to be doing some commentary today about this where. You know, is, is, is Putin finally backing down from uh, the demands of the New World Order from the IMF? He's claiming he's moving troops off the Ukrainian border, although the Pentagon is saying that's not happening. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is that you're dealing with an extremely powerful system in that controls the global world reserve currency, that controls the Western central banks. They can shut down the, the Russian economy or, or, and basically shut down a lot of these oligarchs' uh, finances and resources. We saw kind of what this looks like in Cyprus when they did the bail-ins, where a lot of these Russian billionaire oligarchs had literally a lot of their money stolen from the EU from and from Cyprus. And I think that I think that those countries are beginning to realize that for them to achieve real prosperity, for them to continue their up-and-coming status, they need to get away from the dollar, particularly the fact that the dollar, let's say in China – has caused 200% plus inflation over the last 10 years. I mean, it's completely unsustainable. They need a new model. And I think this is what's going to eventually start the process of them depegging from the U.S. dollar and into some other form of currency. Now, you spoke about uh, you spoke about gold and silver to prepare for the reset, and you talked about holding real assets like real estate. Uh, what are some other things that we can do to prepare for the reset? Uh, and do you... Do you think that farmland? Do you think that's a good uh, a good real estate play? And you know, maybe even if it doesn't go up in value, is that something where you'd be able to grow your own crops and uh, maybe get out of the city if if things really got uh, hairy? Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in all the above. Obviously, with something like farming, people really need to know what they're doing. And unfortunately, that's really not so much the case. I mean, we have farmers in this country are 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 late baby boomers, a huge aging population. Farming is not being taught in, in college. Less than 1%, I believe, are getting degrees in agriculture. It's these big mega uh, corporations, big food corporations that are shutting out the small farmers. And I think that anybody who, again, you know, what I think, you know, the best thing people can do to prepare is I think, you know, we kind of talked about this in the, before, before the interview, Mark, is I think all of us are born with a unique ability. You know, you have the ability, Mark, to write great books. You have the ability to have this great podcast and really edu- educate people. There's somebody that may have the unique ability of being a farmer. Somebody might have a unique ability of being an investor or being some kind of entrepreneur. I think that if we really hone in on what our unique abilities are and we begin to use those unique abilities and seek out who are the other people that have the same type of abilities that are experts in that space, what are they doing? And you'll find that there's in, in countless different, uh, you know, industries or, or, or hobbies, whatever it may be, there's professionals and experts that are making a really good living, basically just promoting and, and talking about and being an expert on their unique ability. And I think that that's where those in the liberty movement, that's where people that understand the importance of self-reliance, I think that's where people should go. I mean, I totally believe in guns, gold, have the plan, all the above. But above and beyond that, I think that we need to start to get away from the job paradigm, which is in essence enslavement of these multinational corporations. And not all. I mean, look, there's good small business owners that are great employers. And if you have a great job, nothing wrong with that. But here's the biggest point, I think, Mark, is that the world is fundamentally changing. The economy is fundamentally changing. We mentioned earlier the 90 million plus people out of out of work. A lot of those people were in industries where those jobs will never come back. Make your own job. Become a job maker, not a job taker. I think that's the number one key point that I would stress in preparing for the challenging times that lie ahead. 
That's really, really good advice. Uh, you always give us a lot of great advice every time you come on the show and, and through your podcast. And, uh, and I'm sure you're going to cover a, a lot of this stuff in, in your new book. Is that, is that right? Yeah, a lot of it is, you know, I, I, you know, we, we, we live in a world, Mark, where people have told us, you know, let us deal with the global financial stuff because it's too complicated for you. Well, you know, I, I, that, that's what I love about this new book is that it, it, it really simplifies things where people can really understand comprehend it and then easily share it because the bottom line is look the average american is smart and they're they're just you know they're they're busy with life and so maybe they're not woken up to the banking cartels or the evil of the federal reserve or what have you i think that's starting to change and i think putting out material out there fiction or nonfiction, that helps people recognize potential scenarios that we face and to plan accordingly like i said earlier it's better to prepare a few years earlier than a few days too late and i think that's what I love so much about the new book, about the uh, about the coming global economic reset, is it explains things and it ties it into history. Again, it's not my theory. It's a historical fact. It's happened many times before, both in modern and ancient history. I believe we're on the cusp of it, of it happening again. And then I'm going to get emails if I don't ask this, so I, so I have to ask it. Can you give us a timeline on where we are in regards to the global economic reset? You know, I don't necessarily I, – I can't give a particular date. I, I, I would say, like I mentioned earlier, you know – uh, the last reset, by the time America passed England as the largest economy, took about 75 years. Today, the world moves much faster. All it would take is a comment from the German finance minister, Chinese finance minister, to come out and say, look, we got a real problem with the dollar. We're going to get away with it. And overnight, you can see things really deteriorate. I can't imagine, Mark, that they could keep up this Ponzi scheme for another 5, 10 years. I just I couldn't imagine it. But look, leading economists – Brilliant minds like Jim Rogers and others thought they couldn't keep the Ponzi scheme going much longer after 2008, and they have. So, again, people need to understand that, yes, it's a giant Ponzi scheme, but the people running it are still extremely powerful, and they're willing to start World War III over or over keeping this current system propped up. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to put a timeline in it, but, again, if I had to – if I had a gun to my head, I'd say I, I couldn't imagine the current financial global system – can remain the same for the next five years. And I think John Rubino, uh, he wrote his book about the, the housing bubble collapse. I think he wrote that in somewhere around 2004. So, uh, like you said, it's, it's better to be four years early than one day late, right? That's exactly right. But, but the, the housing bubble did eventually come. <laughs> yeah, it did eventually come. They're, they, they're, they're working overtime on reinflating it. Like they're trying to reinflate, like they've reinflated every other bubble. And uh, the next, you know, as we've seen, these boom and bust cycles get bigger and bigger. The booms get bigger, the busts get much bigger, and I think that's exactly the climate we're in right now. And you also made a very informative video that folks can access at ger2015.com. Can you just give us a real quick overview of what that was about? Yeah, the, you know, it's, a, it's basically talking about the global economic reset. You know, last summer I was invited to speak at a uh, conference with a few – of my uh, friend, you know, they become friends after a period of time uh, that are, that runs from hedge funds. Uh, they had several of their wealthiest clients in the room. And, um, and so I talk about that in the video uh, also on favoring for They can see a new micro documentary I put out. It's about seven minutes about the global economic reset as well. And um, again, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that the real power behind that message is that it's, it's so rooted in history and we know that history is, in essence, not just repeating itself, but history is almost like a map. It's like a guide. We go back and we know that, you know, humans are flawed. And, and we know that, you know, for example, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution weren't created for a particular period of time. They were created to address those flaws in men. And, and we, that's why, uh, that's why these so-called leaders continue to repeat the same mistakes over and over again because it's, they're egomaniacs or sociopaths and psychopaths that are in essence running the global financial picture. And, and and running Wall Street and have turned it into a large casino. And we're going to have links to your website. We're also going to have links uh, to purchase your book in today's show notes. But now for the folks that are listening on YouTube and Stitcher and iTunes that may not be on uh, Prepper Recon right now to, to click through, can you tell them where they can find those uh, resources? Yeah, sure. They can always go to FabianForLiberty.com. It's the number four, FabianForLiberty.com, all my – uh, economic videos, entrepreneurship videos, global reset videos are posted on there. It's my blog, FabianCalvo.me. We'll tell you a little bit more myself. 
and everything dealing with the global economic reset can be found at ger2015.com, ger2015.com. Well, Fabian, thanks so much for coming on the show, and thanks for all you do to wake the folks up. I, I really think that the battlefield is in the minds of Americans. Uh, Ron Paul said it best. He said we have to have an intellectual awakening to to get any traction on the problems that we're facing. Couldn't agree more, Mark. Our individual first aid kits are now on sale. They're Molly compatible pouches in Coyote, ACU, OD, or Black. They're equipped with an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, TK4 tourniquet, suture kit, and lots of extras. It's perfect for your car, bug out bag, or home first aid kit. Go to the PrepperRecon.com homepage and click on the IFAC store tab at the top of the page. They're on sale for $89, and that includes shipping. This kit could save your life. Hey, preppers and patriots. American Meltdown, the long-awaited sequel to American Exit Strategy, is now available in Kindle and paperback. In American Meltdown, book two of the Economic Collapse Chronicles, the new president, Anthony Howe, signs an executive order banning all semi-automatic weapons. Matt, Adam, and Wesley Baer begin training with their local militia for the battle that is coming. Within weeks of the inauguration, the $700 trillion derivatives bubble pops when rates on U.S. debt skyrocket. The derivatives crisis is the final nail in the coffin of the banking system and the death of the fiat currency system in America. With the dollar gone, commerce comes to a screeching halt. While times prove to be tough for all, survival favors the prepared. Get your Kindle or paperback copy of American Meltdown book two of the economic collapse chronicles on amazon today